Hey everybody, I know this is not the start to the videos that you're used to, but as some of you may or may not know, especially if you follow my Twitter, my brother and I's dad uh, died this past Wednesday night due to throat and mouth can cancer. And uh, we're trying to pick up the pieces and s stuff like that. Um, we set up a GoFundMe to help with the funeral home costs. So I'll be sure to link that in the description of this video. And after that's after the fundraiser is done, I can just go in and edit this part out of the video through YouTube Studio. So uh, if, if you can, uh, donate. Any donations would be appreciated. Uh, even if you can just share the fundraiser, we'll highly appreciate that. Uh, but with that said, let's move on to the video. Hi everyone, and welcome to D&D &D Horror Stories with D&D Doge. In today's video, we have a story about a D&D &D player that makes poor decisions in a game of Dungeons & Dragons, even though the Dungeon Master warned him about the outcome above table. A story about a disgruntled that guy that gets so mad that he sends computer viruses to the DM's computer. And more. But before we get into those, here's a kitty to try to get you to like this video. I think that was worth a like, right? But with that said, let's get into some D&D horror stories. How, by being fair, I caused a problem player to quit the group. By Reddit user Pete Van Grimm. Been reading a lot of posts about problem players recently, so I thought I'd post another of my own. This will be a tad long. Roy McFake name was always a douchebag. Loudmouthed, braggadocious, ignorant, dishonest, and self-centered. I'd call him a narcissist, but I'm not a doctor. I always kind of disliked him, but most of my group at the time, some 16 years ago now, were friends with him, so I sucked it up to maintain the peace. Things were copacetic until I started my very own campaign, D&D 3rd Edition, starting at level 3. It was only my second one ever, and it was lovingly crafted. I drew maps and everything. The party were a mercenary crew who made a small name for themselves, killing kobold raiding bands and other minor threats on the outskirts of their home country's capital. However, rumor was spreading that an immortal king made of steel and shadow had risen from a small nothing country to the northwest, and it was conquering his way across the continent. Okay, that sounds like a pretty cool setup. The intro scene, after initial party introductions, was like so. The party was in the market, doing some shopping after getting a payday, when there is a sort of anti-flash. The world goes pitch black for a moment, and then suddenly, there is a small army at the gates. Around 500 soldiers. At the head of this army is our big bad. He's seven feet tall, and covered from head to toe in a cobalt blue plate mail. An eerie black mist leaks from the slits and joints of the armor. In his right hand is a malevolent scepter, radiating evil power. And his entire left hand has been replaced by a smooth mace, with a head twice the size of a bowling ball. The big bad says nothing. He simply walks up to the city gate and smashes it to splinters with a single strike from his mace hand. Now, this was like a cutscene. Just a little intro to our campaign's final boss, and a not-so-subtle indication that effing with him right now would be a bad idea. The party paladin, not Roy, tries to be a hero, but I have the big bad casually backhand him through a storefront, where he survives only by the grace of landing in a pile of unfolded clothing. The player gets the message, and I figure so does the rest of the party. Spoiler. I figured wrong. So Big Bad makes his way towards the castle, guards and would-be heroes alike, falling like wheat before the scythe. 
one of the guys that the party gets jobs from, says he's leaving the city with a crew going east. He says there's a wizard starting a resistance on the coast. Wink wink, nudge nudge. The party debates the merits of joining up, or maybe just effing off and finding their own way to defeat him. But Roy, playing a ranger, self-appointed super genius that he is, has a better plan. We should join his army, assassinate his honor guard, take their places, and take him out when he least suspects it. I tell him this will probably not go how he thinks it will, but the party thinks to give it a shot and just bail out of town if things go awry. So the party follows the Trail of Carnage to the upper district where the big bad with the former king's severed head on the podium is giving a speech about how this country is now his, and if people don't want to die, they should not oppose him, yada yada yada. Big Bad's regular soldiers are quelling the masses, but the honor guard dips into a nearby tavern. Roy demands that the party go in after them, where he confronts them at the bar. You ladies look like you need some help, says Roy to them by means of introduction. Now, I'm paraphrasing as this conversation happened almost two decades ago, but this is the gist of it. Guard Captain What did you say? Roy My friends and I want to join up, as you look like you need some competent fighters. Guard Captain Piss off before I get angry, worm. Roy, out of character I roll persuasion. Oh, a nat 20. He says, rolling out of sight of everyone and picking the die up before anyone can see it. Me. Roy, man, it's not gonna work. I pull out a character sheet and say, You are currently arguing with an end-of-game mini-boss right now. He's over 10 levels higher than you. I'm metagaming this right now to give you a chance to back off. Roy. I rolled a nat 20. I should at least get to join their army. Me. Nat 20s are not always a guaranteed success with skill rolls. Besides, besides the fact that this guy hates you, he has nothing to do with general recruitment into their army. At best, he's going to direct you to the master at arms and dismiss you. At worst, you're going to annoy him into killing you. So what's it going to be? Now, OP pretty much laid out that this course of action would not end well. So, what do you think Roy is going to do? Roy Well, I'm not going to be pushed around by an underling, and I'm going to demand to see the warlord. He rolls persuasion again. 19 on the die, so 25. So, to make an infantile and long argument shorter, Roy doesn't back down and continues to roll his dice. High rolls that no one sees, of course. I end the argument with the guard captain smashing a tankard into his face. Guard captain, of course, beats his AC easily, and with all his magical enhancements and high level, does enough damage to be lethal to this level 3 scrub. Roy, what the F? You're gonna player kill me just because you suck at improvising as a DM? Me, no, you're not gonna die. I'm cutting off this particular avenue you're pursuing because the campaign I've prepared lies in a different direction and I'm not going to put up with spiteful sidetracking. So your character is unconscious and busted up. The honor guards strip you of your possessions and clothing, hogtie you, and hang you by your ankles and wrists from the tavern sign outside. If the party doesn't cut you down first, you wake up the next morning in this position with all your stuff strewn about the gutters. The party can grab this for you too if you don't want it stolen. The guard captain and crew warn the party to leave them alone or things are going to get lethal. So, Roy chose poorly. The party says they'll collect his stuff, but they leave him tied up because they don't want to piss off the guards further. They decide to flee the city to go see what's happening on the coast after they gather up the naked ranger in the morning. The entire time they are planning out their trip and as they make their way out of the city, 
Roy is seething in silence, and eventually, he stands up and points his finger at me. Roy, F you, man. I'm out of this group until your crappy campaign is done, or until you learn to be a better DM. Me, I didn't let you join the bad guys. That is literally the only thing I won't let you do. And you're gonna be pissy about it? Roy, get effed. He then gathered up his stuff and left. He never did come back to this group, but the other players were in other, future groups with him, and his demanding, domineering attitude persisted. We stopped the session after that, and I never ran that game again. I got discouraged by the confrontation, and let it get into my head, so I didn't run another game for years after that. So yeah, F. Roy, that miserable dick. My only solace is, these days, he struggles to find groups because he never grew up, and the community in town is sick of his crap. Yep, definitely sounds like Roy was your stereotypical that guy. Was OP railroading the group to a certain point? Yeah, but a little bit of railroading at the beginning of a campaign is kinda needed to get the ball rolling, and Roy took all the hints that OP gave about which direction to go and went the opposite direction. Now, the party did follow, probably out of curiosity, and OP did tell Roy above table that the course of action he wanted to take would not end well. But, of course, Roy still effed around and found out, and then got all salty and flipped out on OP over the consequences of his own actions, even though OP was nice enough to not kill his character outright. It is a shame, though, that this discouraged OP from running that game, as it sounded like a pretty cool story setup, and OP put a lot of time into it. Hopefully, OP did end up running that story again, but this time, without any sort of that guy like Roy. Let's move on to the next one. But hurt D&D player sends malware to DM's computer after his character died. By Reddit user, OK Aragula3531. This story is kind of awkward, because we were all friends who played D&D on Discord. To top it off, my cousin, Eric Cockra Monk, is still best friends with the that guy, Eric Cockra Wizard, of the story. The Dungeon Master also happens to be dating one of the players, an Orc Ranger. I was a halfling cleric. Our campaign started in a castle of this noble. We were all this noble's courtiers until she sent us out on our first mission. After that mission, we gained some XP and she sent us out to explore the world for suspicious hobgoblin activity. We didn't find the hobgoblin she was worried about, but ended up in some dragonborn empire that held a very powerful magic item. Now, Aarakocra Wizard was a klepto. He was always trying to steal, and if stealth didn't work, he'd just kill the people who caught him. Notably, he ended up killing a dragonborn prince after he snuck into said prince's treasury looking for armor, loot, magic items, etc., and got caught. He killed the prince after the prince saw him looting, an action we strongly advised against, might I add. He then tried to hide the prince's body by casting Plane Shift and sending him to another realm. He failed automatically though, because he was not even supposed to have Plane Shift at this level. We then got caught and faced the wrath of the Dragonborn Emperor. We were all arrested. The rest of us disavowed his actions, except for my cousin, the monk Arakakra, and were granted a pardon if we embarked on a dangerous quest to find this evil sword the magic item we came for in the first place. But Aarakocra Wizard was kinda caught red-handed, so he was to be executed, as was Monk. Well, 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 if it isn't the consequences of his own actions. But why was the Monk also to be executed? Was he with the Wizard while he did the deed? Aarakocra Wizard tried to escape using Hypnotic Pattern. Unfortunately, the guards passed, and then he panicked, throwing all spells from Acid Splash to Fireball 
to even trying to sneak in Meteor Swarm of all spells. Again, he obviously wasn't going to be able to cast a spell like that at his level. The guards then asked him his last words, as now, the player was now raging in real life, and then he was killed. I mean, what did he expect? He was caught killing the Emperor's son. Arokakra, wizard player, was now screaming, Are you effing serious? And Dungeon Master tried to, in the kindest terms, explain that this game would not be fun without potentially dire consequences for dangerous actions. Arokakra, wizard's player, then kept going off, and my cousin tried to join in too, and said the DM was being unfair. Me and DM's boyfriend defended DM, and then Wizard just started shouting us down too. The argument ended when Wizard's player called her the C-word at a point until she just had enough and kicked Wizard from the call. Yeah, that would do it. We all talked about what happened for a bit, and then went to bed. A few days later, I got a call from the DM explaining that she got hacked. She was very distraught, so me, her, and her boyfriend all met up. She told us how she clicked on a Discord link from that guy that took her to this weird site that apparently dumped viruses onto her computer. So now, her computer is basically broken, with weird command prompts popping up random programs and the computer freezing up. She was very emotional, so me and DM's boyfriend confronted that guy on my phone. He, for some reason, tried to deny it, even though it was on his Discord profile. He claimed he was hacked, but when pressed, he just got pissed off again and basically admitted it, and blamed DM for quote, making him resort to extreme actions. Me and DM's boyfriend told him what a piece of crap he was, and then he kept trying to justify it, saying that we cyberbullied him, that her computer wouldn't have been affected if it weren't so, quote, old and crappy, and that he was, quote, doing her a favor by making her get a new one, and then mocked her for not having an antivirus program. Bear in mind that DM is crying in the background. At the end of this back and forth, DM's boyfriend was angrier than I had ever seen him, and told him that if he ever sees him again, he will knock his teeth out, and then we hung up. After the incident, we reported his account to Discord and stopped speaking to him. All of us, except my cousin, who says that he gets that he went too far, but says that he just has trouble with his emotions, and tried to subtly blame us for being so hard on him. He even convinced DM not to press charges. However, she still obviously refuses to speak to him and told my cousin to stop trying to relay his messages to her or defend him. Now, that is a drastic thing to do to try and get back at the Dungeon Master for killing off a character. Wizard definitely went too far with that, and for OP's cousin to try and excuse that behavior because Wizard quote, has trouble controlling his emotions, is no excuse. It's a good thing that they permabanned him from that game, and hopefully, OP was able to at least reformat her computer instead of having to buy a new one. Let's move on to the next post. Had my worst session ever yesterday. By Reddit user Tarudizer. So, I'm still relatively new to D&D and tabletop RPGs. Got introduced to D&D two years ago through a one-shot and instantly fell in love. When two different campaigns with my friends fizzled out after just three sessions, I got a bit tired of not being able to play. So, I started looking online. I found a group after a surprisingly long time with very few responses, and I'm enjoying that campaign very much. Shout out to the DM, Keenan, who is doing a great job. But I wanted to play more than just once a week, and in particular, I wanted to play D&D physically and maybe even get some friends along the way that are more invested and reliable than my current friends. I found a local community that hosts multiple groups that just started back up after the summer vacation. Went there yesterday 
and got a group set up to play, Fandelver, and Below the Shattered Obelisk, and all seemed well. All was not well. Nothing was well. First of all, we were seven players. Seven. I'm sure experienced groups who know each other very well, like the Critical Role people, can make that work. But a bunch of random strangers? Eh. Let's go down the list of these strangers, shall we? I'll start with the DM. He was adamant that everyone use either standard array or point by to determine stats, because rolling inevitably makes someone very overpowered, and that makes balancing a nightmare. I nod and think, yes, that's very reasonable. But then we were told to choose a level between 1 to 4, individually. Wait, but wouldn't that make balancing more of a nightmare than people rolling for stats? The math ain't mathing here. So my level 1 sorcerer was hanging out with multiple level 3s and 4s. He claimed this was fine. Did you catch a little whiff of foreshadowing there? He also claimed he was okay with, quote, doing something silly, but not deliberately stupid, which I thought was odd, because he made our characters appear like complete and total fools. Like, for instance, narrating how a missed sword swing from our fighter made the character swing above himself like he was swatting a fly against a three-foot-tall goblin. Even before that, that same fighter said he wanted to, quote, walk up to that goblin over there, and the DM made him actually walk, using only half his movement, and thus not reaching the goblin because he didn't specify run. Yeah, that is a load of BS. I would have argued against that. The DM fully knew what the fighter meant. He also made nat ones, or even just low rolls, come with noticeable penalties, which, sniff sniff, hmm, there's that foreshadowing again. Player 1 came prepared. He had everything, including multiple character figures, so I thought, dang, this guy knows his crap. Nope. After another player stated that he wanted to play a ranger, the same class he wanted to play, he then spent more than half the session creating his character on D&D Beyond. And at the end, he still wasn't actually finished, and didn't know his stat modifiers, etc. Player 2 was even worse. She came in an hour late, which is kind of whatever. You don't really know what made someone late. I thought I was going to be late, because right before I meant to leave, I suddenly had to destroy my bathroom, but I digress. A little bit of TMI there, but let's move on. Because she was so late, she just used the character that she had been using before, which was a barbarian. That's it. That's all she knew about it. She didn't know her own subclass, background, what weapon she had, her stat modifiers, or even her frickin' race. And every single time the DM asked her something, she spent five minutes going, um, and for two rounds of combat, did nothing, even after she was attacked. I'm a bit confused here. So this was a character she had used before in what I assume was a different game, yet she still didn't know how to play it? And if that is the case, you would think another player at the table would be willing to help her out during combat instead of just letting her do nothing. This table sounds like a nightmare so far. Player 3 was a literal child, an actual human spawnling, no more than maybe 11 years old a.k.a. Chaos Incarnate made flesh. He was sat next to me and practically vibrated in his seat. Every turn, he asked if his wizard, named Bob, could cast two spells. He left after he set fire to one of our wagons because of an at one, and his character was knocked unconscious by a single arrow because he too was level one. Now, I do have to stop and ask the obvious. If the DM said to make characters that are between level 1 and 4, why would anyone, including OP, decide to make a level 1 character? It just doesn't make much sense in my head. Player 4 was Player 3's mother, who was brand new, 
and the least likely person to really do anything useful and quickly. But she made her turn quickly and efficiently, and actually attacked the damn goblins. Player 5 was maybe the worst. He had clearly played a lot of Baldur's Gate 3, and continuously kept saying that we could do X because that was a bonus action. And I kept telling him, in Baldur's Gate, yes, but not in D&D. Seriously, he would not stop. He was also seated in the middle of Player 2 and Player 4, who both hadn't quite figured out how to read their character sheet on D&D Beyond, and every time they rolled to hit or attack, he peeked at the dice, then at their character sheet, then said the total out loud before they could. Now, coming from Baldur's Gate 3 to D&D, things could be a bit confusing to a new player, as, like Opie said, there are things that you can do in Baldur's Gate 3 that you can't do in D&D, and I can see how, if that player would keep arguing that, could get a bit annoying. But in the end there, it just sounded like that player was helping the other players figure out their totals. Could he have done it without shouting out their numbers? Sure, but at least he was trying to help them. Before I get to player 6, it's important to note that I rolled really low on initiative and was last, so the goblins had their turns before me and hit me twice, knocking me unconscious before my first turn. Why the DM focus fired and attacked my level 1 sorcerer with 11 AC and 8 HP twice instead of targeting someone like, oh, I don't know, the level 4 fighter with 20 AC and 28 HP? I cannot tell you. But down I went. So my first turn was rolling a death save which I failed. Player 6 then willingly spent his turn grabbing and pulling my character to safety and tried to stabilize me. He rolled a 5 on his medicine check, so our DM thought this was a great opportunity to punish this attempt at team play, and once again narrated our characters as being stupid idiots, so his character accidentally snapped my back and I got another failed death save. Ah, that is what the foreshadowing was about. And yeah, that is a bit BS for the DM to do that. I can see someone doing that with a nat 1, but for just having a low roll? Yeah, that is BS. My next, and only second roll, of the session was me then failing my third death save, causing my character to die during our second round of combat. I straight up just bounced. There might be groups there that are more suited to my style of play, but I need a couple days to recover before I inquire about that. Bloody hell. Yeah, I probably would have done the same thing if that happened to me. That whole table just sounded so chaotic, with a dungeon master that barely knew what he was doing and couldn't handle a few players that were new to D&D. Plus the whole thing with punishing the players for just rolling low instead of just having them fail at what they were trying to do is a bit much. Though at least OP has their online game to fall back on in order to get his D&D fix. And hopefully, their next time going to the gaming club will result in them finding another better table. But that is all I have for you today. As always, I appreciate all of you, and may your games remain horror story free. Until next time.